So in the past, I've highlighted quite some times my interest in my all-time greatest pastime in not one, but several videos explaining my love for a show where the main character is very stretchy in more ways than one. But the news of a live action showcase got me and a whole lot of fans in a state of anticipation as well as mostly fear. Some of us are still suffering the last case of PTSD from the previous Netflix adaptation. Welcome to the ass, mother <laughs> And some older folks still have to go day to day with the shell shock that was Dragon Ball Evolution. However, from the reactions of many, it seemed to be getting more and more positive as the promotions kept coming. Suddenly, those casts of doubt were starting to dissipate slowly, and everyone was feeling a sense of excitement. No more were we promised cool looking set designs or that terrifying going merry figurehead. Now we have characters like Buggy the Clown coming to life in a terrifying getup, and Luffy's gum gum powers looking about as passable as a computer generated rubber can get. So pre-evaluation, will this adaptation heal the old wounds for Tomorrow Studios' last attempt at mainstream relevancy? Or am I going to have to indulge in this bottle of Captain Morgan's finest rum? Your being a pirate is the history of Pirates Media is as far as the eye can see, to the very birth of the art form with classics like the Seahawk, Captain Kidd, or Blackbeard the Pirate. Then you have a category of child-friendly pirate depictions like Disney's adaptation of Peter Pan and the character of Captain Hook. There have been several adaptations of both Peter Pan and Treasure Island in the long timeline of film, and while some stay faithful, others would jump into new horizons. However, the thing about pirate films I haven't mentioned yet is that they are ungodly criminals of production costs. Because turns out, shooting in the open seas costs a hell of a lot to manage, and you can look to one cutthroat island that almost killed Gina Davis's career. See, I took your balls. Carol Cole was already in deep financial trouble before the movie came out, and they increased the budget of the feature despite investors overseas abandoning ship. A lot of crew members got injured in production, as well as some of the actors having to perform their own stunts, one involving Gina Davis having to roll over a roof onto a wagon which resulted in bruises. Nobody was safe from this production from hell that bombed so big and was almost the death of big budget Hollywood movies involving not just females in leading roles, but just high seas adventures. As much as stuff like the Pirates of the Caribbean franchise would get the ball rolling again, Disney's very own Treasure Planet, a sci-fi retelling of the classic Robert Louis Stevenson novel, would also mark the end of Disney's efforts in 2D animation. Despite Musker and Clements doing their damnest to make their dream project with a steampunk design and a mostly positive reception, its piss-poor marketing and release schedule meant that any hopes of this turning a profit for Disney were squandered before it even came out. Let's not forget Kevin Costner's Waterworld in this box office disaster, or a similar story that happened to DreamWorks and their seafaring children's flick Sinbad. If you're going to have it take place in the open sea, you, as a distributor, have to abandon all hopes. However, where film has a rough time with getting net positives, television has had a much better turnaround with shows like the underrated Black Sail and Our Flag Means Death. So, a One Piece live action could work under the right circumstances, and not just be another run-of-the-mill swashbuckling adventure, much like Cutthroat Island. Then since you lie so easily, and since you are so shallow, I shall lie you in a shallow grave. It should all come together nicely, but then you have other problematic factors. It's based on a Japanese property, and Netflix is running it. We'll dig up the box. We know it's full of precious booty. Strange thing is, One Piece actually seemed like the best material to adapt into live action. Firstly, its appeal is global, being one of the most successful media series still ongoing, even edging out Lord of the Rings with $20 billion in revenue. Secondly, its resurgence in the popular trending topics based on the performance of his latest arc and movie brought a lot of attention to the decades-long adventure with its conclusion nearly in sight. Finally, unlike Cowboy Bebop, whose biggest misstep was trying to reflect the same tone and energy the original had, One Piece is much easier to fluctuate for a wider audience. 
Netflix's Cowboy Bebop is something I talked at great lengths about in a video essay I did a couple of years back. I still stand by that Netflix's mandates to the binge format disrupt the overall narrative that the original represented, and like a powdered keg waiting to blow, it resulted in a very messy adaptation. I even had my doubts about One Piece being brought to life as well. I am a huge One Piece nerd, and I became anxious when the same studio was involved in the making of it. But to my surprise, where Cowboy Bebop creator Shinjiro Watanabe was fairly displeased and not even giving a consultation on how they were adapting his work, Ichiro Oda had the opposite kind of treatment. But that could also be a means to get the fans to bless the live-action production. In an interview with Oda for the New York Times before the live-action release, Oda said, a live-action adaptation of a manga doesn't simply reenact the source material on a one-to-one -one basis. It involves thinking about what fans would love about the characters, the dynamics of among them, and being faithful to those elements. A good live-action show doesn't have to change the story too much. The most important thing is whether the actors can reproduce the characters in a way that will satisfy the people who read the manga. I think we did it well, so I hope the audiences will accept it. In all likelihood, One Piece was a much better choice for syndicated binge-consuming television than an episodic story spanning the galaxy. However, none of those things matter when it comes to the cost to achieve it, and that was another hurdle for One Piece's live-action operation. Reportedly, it was said that One Piece's live-action budget was greater than the initial budget of Game of Thrones, though take that with a grain of salt. To make an adaptation of this measure work, especially early on when the series was still in its baby years, capturing those landmarks was essential, and the production videos released went heavy on presenting that feeling to a ravenous crowd. Marketing played a very important role in getting people excited for the release, and had to play it especially hard during the COVID pandemic, and still ongoing by the time of this video, an historic writer and actor's strike that limited promotional content. So, in a way, this could be the most significant streaming platform bargain of the era, and in a different universe, could have been disastrous. Yet, what came out was a very positive reception, and what looks to be a successful streaming debut with it breaking records on its first weekend on the platform. And I'm inclined to be a very happy fan in that case. Issues, sure, but if everything was hamburgers, we wouldn't have hot dogs. Okay, appetizers are done. Let's start the main course. The East Blue Saga is One Piece's version of the Goo Goo Dolls. They were setting out the basics, and many of the plot lines weren't very fleshed out. Some of it could be due to kinks that needed ironing out on Oda's part, the artwork was a little bit rough, and the dialogue wasn't the best. And even to this day, it's still not one of Oda's strong points. For example, Orange Town and Surf Village were two arcs with fairly benign story structures, and by comparison to the rest of the arcs in East Blue, were the weakest by far. Buggy's fun and all, but the entire plot of his introduction has a difficult time staying still and gets pretty boring fast. Usopp's story, meanwhile, introduces fun concepts, but doesn't go all the way with them, lending it to sometimes be too slow and the villains being too one note. Given these problems, the live-action crew had a lot to work around in restructuring these storylines into a more linear format for streaming. That means some aspects had to be altered or cut down due to time and budget. And where, oh where, was the dancing lion? Do you know how much a CGI lion costs? These include Luffy punching a sea monster, Buggy's signature cannonball, Gaimon, Usopp's gang of kit pirates, Zoro's old bounty hunting buddies, Hachi the octopus. Moments small and large had to be changed or removed to make the reality of this world work. Almost work, we'll get to that. They're attacking the village. We are going to talk about this one. Yet the biggest change was most definitely how it's all put together. The live action show takes a lot of inspiration for its anime companion piece, the manga, in many ways. For instance, Kubi meets Luffy on a remote island, whereas in the anime, it's on a ship being invaded. The famous Luffy help me scene is lifted almost exactly from how the anime did it. The visual style of the live action show has a love for the source material and its anime adaptation, reflected in how it presents its moments to the audience with a very Scott Pilgrim, Edgar Wright-esque comic book styling. Two of the best examples of this have to be near the first half of the show, 
primarily Orangetown and Sir Village. Instead of being just a seaside town or a quiet out of the way village with a mansion at the back, the live action reimagines these towns in big ways. Orangetown looks exactly like it does in the original, but takes advantage of the fact that a circus is in town, and Buggy takes the entire town hostage as a literal captive audience, not only showing off the demented and cruel display of Buggy's nature, but also taking the trope of a circus from hell into the One Piece verse that the other versions didn't do before. Surf Village has changed to a shipbuilding center, Kaya serves as heir to that bustling shipyard inheritance, and the plot centers itself around the Mistress's Mansion, home to a Freddy Krueger butler and his cat-obsessed servants. Instead of the climax taking place on a very boring and not that very nice looking hillside, the setting of a horror movie mansion with passageways and decorative rooms plays out as a better setting for not just action, but also character interaction. Especially for Kaya, who's been given a lot more urgency this time. These decisions were perhaps made to cut costs for outdoor scenes, so they worked with what would be best for the settings. And One Piece has quite the reputation for reworking conventional scenarios to enhance the experience. And when it comes to the scenes that matter, they very much capture that original magic. There is this genuine attitude in how characters present themselves, and reflect what they believe in without having this just spelled out for the audience like it was in the manga. The clunky dialogue and inconsistent plot lines are given a much more well-executed finesse to them. And I'd even go as far as to say Orange Town and Parth's Third Village were done better here than in their respective origins. Even if that isn't consistent in every episode, there are no signals that the production staff and writers were half-assing it at all like it was with Cowboy Bebop, and that credit goes to Matt Owens and Steven Maida. In an interview with Steven Maida for Screen Rant, he had this to say about adapting the series to television. It was finding that balance, and then also the balance between the hardcore fans who love every moment, and every minutia, you know, every detail and minutia of One Piece, but also how do we rope in new fans who have no idea what One Piece is? What's this crazy show with a pink pirate ship and a guy with stretchy powers? What's that about? And so the hardest thing, and still I think the hardest thing, is finding that balance. It's a very different story compared to the very first live action adaptation Tomorrow Studio was a part of, and it's probably what made One Piece work well crossing over into the real world. However, as Mana put it, there is that balance problem, and so it needs a main cast to keep it all together. Even if on their own, they would find themselves floating in barrels at the bottom of the ocean. I'm looking at you, Inaki. All great fighters call out their finishing moves. No, they don't. We set sail and explore, and Ren and Jim all day. This could be an interesting case, since I do think all the actors have pros and cons in their performances. Not everyone can be perfect, but as long as they can capture the purity and essence of their characters, I think we'll be more forgiving. Then again, this is the anime fandom, and they are less charitable than most others when it comes to reimagining their 2D characters. I mean, sheesh, fans have gotten so toxic. Simply put, we've had tons of duds in the last decades, and even when Japanese studios try to involve themselves in these adaptations, uh, they're... God damn it, they're trash. I think the benefit of ushering more of an unknown bank of international talent helped the series globally resonate with wider diaspora communities considering the world of One Piece has a lot of multiculturalism in it. Out of the crop of auditions and a plethora of folks wanting to play these characters, I'm happy to say they all got them down pretty well. Inaki has his level of charm and charisma about him that makes for a very endearing character, and he plays Luffy with a different air, yet never in a demeaning manner. He still got that emotional intelligence of knowing the deeper meaning in anything, like with his interactions with Kobe and his crew members. The one thing he does have, however, is a greater sense of urgency, whereas the original Luffy wouldn't do anything heroic just for the hell of it. He needs a selfish reason. His character dilemma is a little awkward, granted, but the majority of Inaki's performance still has that hardened energy of a kid who goes from playing a pirate to becoming a pirate. Shanks always said, that if the path to what you want seems too easy, then you're on the wrong path. Makenyu as Roronoro Zoro has the best action scenes in the season, and is a good example of this show's choreography and action set pieces. 
It's very impressive that he can do most of his stunts, and that his filmography has him very comfortable in various action-oriented productions. That includes his time as Scar, a character who is supposed to be representing a darker skin race of people. Ah! And on that note, the only thing I have against McKenyu here is that his take on Zoro is a lot more stern and stubborn. Zoro, especially early on, had his badass moments and was playing the straight man role in the opposition to Luffy, but he does have quirky elements that make him interesting. Early Zoro had sort of this defensiveness about him, but underneath it lies someone who can be insecure about himself and tries to hide his embarrassing mishaps to come off as the serious member of the crew. Although it's nice he still has that bad sense of direction. Like here he is going through the exact same room saying we'll split up and search for clues, and all of a sudden he's right back at the entranceway. Classic Zoro. The reason I bring this up is because he can play straight man well in the comedic portions, but somehow I can't find him that compelling in the more dramatic scenes. Zoro vs. Mihawk was the first time the swordsman had to eat humble pie, and that meant he wasn't immune to his emotions. He cried and solemnly vowed his allegiance to Luffy in what is now his most iconic moment in the series. As for live action, McKenyu seemed a bit too held back in his delivery, and I just feel as if he wasn't doing enough to sell that side of his character. It's become the greatest swordsman. I will never lose again. Although. One side I feel he unintentionally delivers on is the moments of sensual attraction. So bring on the marines or pirates or sea beasts. You're my captain Luffy, and I'm your first mate. Usopp and Sanji both equally work well in their respective roles, with Jacob and Taz's performances employing their characters' strengths. In the original, they tend to fall through the stereotypical rules of Sanji's having the most difficulty considering perfect characters are frowned upon more in the West. Sanji can be very smooth in his delivery, and Taz finds ways to make him more hopelessly naive and cute than horny, which is a good thing. Oh, a true artist never reveals his secrets, but... I could be talked into offering some private lessons. Nice try. <laughs> Although... The hurriness is only for his one true love. Story, like any woman, she is a mystery to be unraveled. Now you made a choice. You don't know why. The only thing I want to hear from you at dinner is special. Ooh, back for seconds. You must have liked it. It was okay. That place is different. Which is a lot more I can say than Usopp's character in this version because there's not a whole lot he can do here. Heck, he doesn't even fire a cannonball in this version when they're running from the Marines. And we'll get to why in a moment. As such, he is more of a comedic side character and doesn't have too much dedicated time to shine apart from his fight with the fishmen. And again, boom, boom, boom. Down goes the yard. Marie's dead in the water. All thanks to the great Captain Usopp. Nami's performance is easily the one most fans are waiting for, and Emily does an excellent job showcasing the best qualities of our favorite cat burglar. She does a lot more showcasing her thievery talent in this version than others, and the more robust version of her signature bow staff presents way more possibilities in the action. One Piece's East Blue may center around the main character Luffy, but the protagonist that drives the plot forward is arguably Nami. You're the best I've ever seen, but you are not better than him. If you fight him tomorrow, you're going to lose. Why do you even give a shit? Because you're my friend, you idiot. However, her role is kind of shifted around a bit to make way for the secondary main character in Kobe's B-plot, but she works the same. Rudd plays her off much like the original, but has more of a standoffish attitude, even stealing from people like Kaya instead of just regular pirates that she hates. This is a strange change considering that Nami doesn't steal from just regular folks. She even commented this when Luffy questioned her about it. Okay, technically she doesn't actually steal from Kaya here, and it probably leads to one of the most important interactions in the series. But when her time to shine comes, she absolutely nails it. That Luffy help me scene was fucking great. The rest of the actors do a pretty good job recreating their version of the characters, and some even add on to them, including the main villains of their stories. Buggy the Clown and Mihawk were probably the scene stealers of the show, both for their interpretations that make these characters come to life even more. Jeff Ward and Stephen Ward were brilliant in their performances. What did you just say? Just that everyone knows who you are. Knows! 
you're strong, but fighting isn't all about strength. Stop talking and fight. Regardless of personal thoughts on a few performances that didn't do so well, and that includes a couple of the kid actors. But they are coming, and Dad's coming with them. He'll be home soon, I promise. I still was blown away by their commitment to the show, and here's hoping to the non-regulars that they got some work on the way, especially during this time. However, we have to now explore the unfortunate price adaptations have to pay, when some changes just don't work no matter how far you stretch it. I'm talking about Garp. I'm Scottish! The A, B, and C plots of television writing are ubiquitous in any format, and with the jump to live action, One Piece has to alter the pace of its episodes to accommodate stretches that need attention. The A plot follows Luffy and his adventures, while the B plot focuses on Kobe's cadet expedition with Vice Admiral Garp, who is also Luffy's grandpa. As for the C plots, I guess just give it the buggy since it won't be relevant until next season. Plus, more buggy scenes is just a cherry on top. Oh, there once was a girl with tangerine hair. Stole my map and let me strand it somewhere. Truly a crafty and crooked young lass, but you can't deny she had a spectacular Ow! Now, for this discussion, we have to look at Garb's overall significance to the narrative and where some of the issues start to arise. Apart from many of the action sequences, performances, and even the visual effects, though some look incredibly low res or just not convincing, the main problem correlates with Garp's inclusion early on in the story. In the original, Garp was introduced in Kobe's cover story, in addition by Oda to tell side stories of previous arc characters and their misadventures outside the main plot. Kobe and Helmeppo become chore boys, cause a ruckus, and eventually become Garp's apprentices. Instead, the live action expands upon that story and becomes a secondary plot that also links together with the primary one, like with episodes 4, 5, and 8. Now, hear me out. This is not a bad plotline. Much of what it contains has fairly impressive character moments for both Kobe and Garp, which gets us to understand their connection to the world and gives more clues to understand for the Vice Admiral's characterization. I joined the Marines over 50 years ago. A green recruit like yourself. I came in with simple ideals, but I had to adapt because the world is not a simple place. Yet despite this, they seem to have the side effect of diluting attention away from our main cast and disrupting the flow of the story. For example, like Haya's mansion, Usopp escapes and tries to warn the villagers that pirates are invading. But surprise, no one believes him because, you know, allegory to Boy Who Cried Wolf. Kobe comes in and seemingly believes his story and goes right back to the mansion with Usopp. Kuro blindsides him by offering Luffy as a means to dissolve any witnesses and just leaves without going back. If that is all, I really must return to my duties. It leads to Luffy getting out of Marine custody, a la Zoro, and the two of them re enter the mansion to have their big fight with the villains. Hold her right there! By order of the Marines, I'm placing you under arrest. I disagree. The Marines' influence on the main plot just feels like fluff, and honestly, would have been better spent on developing Usopp's character since he is the one the arc is designed around. Usopp in the manga did the exact same thing as well, but it was also a culmination of him being chased by the villagers, getting rejected by Kaya, being shot at, yet making the brave decision to fight against an unwinnable situation for the sake of his village. The Marine subplot interrupts the sequence of events, and even though he still has his moment to shine, it just doesn't hit as hard, and he gets sidelined from his big character moments. There isn't even much of a showdown between him and Kuro, he just kind of gets pussy whipped to the corner, which Come to think of it, for as much of a master planner Kuro is, he seems to always suck at just doing the dirty deed. I guess like most cats, he just wants to talk all day and not commit to anything they set their mind to. Am I right, Mallory the Destroyer?
Garp, I feel, is a very weird addition to this part of the story, too, since during this portion of the saga, no major marine character has any likable traits and are supposed to be seen as impulsive, whiny, very cowardly bullies with no redeeming qualities. The only marines who believe in justice yet protect the well-being of their citizens are Smoker and Tashiki. So the addition of Garp, a vice admiral of high authority and prestige who can change the very plot with no effort, seems just to f all with it. F clown. Even then, live-action Garp acts very different from his original, as the Marine in the comic was almost an older, slightly wiser Luffy. He is a lazy, eccentric old man who doesn't care about authority, and would even be at odds with the government he works for. He was a mysterious character as so we didn't know too much about him, or even Luffy for that matter. It works because it gives the audience time to speculate and be invested in the eventual reveal when Luffy and Garp finally meet again. One Piece is one of those series that is famous or maybe infamous for holding off secrets until the right moment and building them up until their big surprise. That's why the main MacGuffin, the One Piece, is the biggest driving force of the narrative. Fans being drip-fed clues is one of the reasons we love this series. So when the big reveal of Luffy and Garp's relationship is revealed, the surprise doesn't feel as big because at this point, we don't feel a connection yet to our main hero. The answer lies in how long Luffy stays a stagnant character, an enigma with a straw hat. Yet now, we have a rising conflict that gets sandwiched into a whole lot of other situations. Because on top of Arlong, Mihawk, and Nami's situation, we now have Luffy's dire consequences to tack on as well. We are now knees deep in too many swampy details. <laughs> it's the reason why, despite my appreciation for the first half, the second half has the issue of being too fast and too slow. And I gotta put my tinfoil hat on this. If One Piece was given two more episodes, these issues wouldn't be a problem. This is a situation that is not just exclusive to One Piece. It affects every big budget streaming show out there at this point. At least we forget all those Star Wars shows that were supposed to be movies yet slapped together as Rush Disney Plus exclusives. Not enough writers and not enough time to produce means the elements of shows had to be cut down. One of several reasons the entertainment industry is in a f crossroads right now. One of the primary regrets that Maida had when producing One Piece was not allowing enough time to finish the first season at Logtown. As he put it, the biggest one for me that we didn't get to do was Logtown in the present day, and we needed two more episodes to be able to do it, and there wasn't the budget, there wasn't the screen time and there wasn't room in the eight episodes to do it the way it deserves to be done. And then, of course, I want to come back to Logtown, and just couldn't fit it in the eight episodes. I felt like we were rushing, and was also a very expensive build. And so, that's a regret, for sure. Okay, one of the biggest misses that I can find was with the tail end of the Arlong storyline. The biggest change was Nami's connection to her village, and that she lied to them to protect them from Arlong's wrath. In the original, they all knew that Nami was lying to them, yet kept up an act so that she would never feel obligated to stay under Arlong's thumb. Even when all her money gets stolen and all of their hopes is lost, they still stick up for her and know that even if they die against the Fishmen, Nami can still run away and live her life. This is a vital moment because it represents the twist in the third act of the Arlong arc and sets up the memorable conclusion that makes this arc one of the best in the series. It was also at this exact moment that One Piece began to set itself apart from its contemporaries, and is still fondly remembered as the start of everything great. Not only is that mostly left out, but it also is jumbled haphazardly together into a much more clumsily written aftermath. After the scene where all the strats get together and start to make their approach to Arlong Park, the village gets attacked off screen by Arlong's fishmen. They're attacking the village. That just kills my motivation. Cut to the next episode, and the villagers are starting to make their last stand, but Luffy and the gang stop them fairly easily and storm the castle without them. This is my fight. No. This is our fight. Now, if you were fresh off the boat when you saw this, you would think of how pointless this little scene was. Yet with context, this is maybe one of the worst ways to salvage this moment. 
It's a real dilemma that the show had to straddle with, and while many of the highlights in Arlong Park still hit from an action to character standpoint, the story behind it was pretty lackluster and not as memorable. This all culminates with Garf facing Luffy after the defeat of the Arlong Pirates, and the whole thing resolved itself in a fairly anticlimactic turn. This whole cat and mouse game was just a test to see if Luffy had the guts to go out and live his pirate fantasy. Garp was just f***ing around, very in character, but also a bit lacking in logic. As such, the final episode of One Piece Live Action had the unfortunate curse of ending the entire first season on what was essentially an are you winning grandson meme. Heck, even him just hiring Mihawk, the strongest swordsman and warlord in the world, to go after a nobody wannabe pirate felt like some guy asking his global elite buddy on CSGO to enter a silver lobby just for the lols. Just killing some time. So yeah, this subplot of the Marines didn't quite work out as intended, and it highlighted some major issues that the series would have to be careful of if it wants to continue down the road. Yet, I think against all the low-hanging problems and missed opportunities, because it also just felt good to watch One Piece come to life. Crazy, I know, but I am going to make a comparison. The Lord of the Rings trilogy was previously known to be almost impossible to adapt, a fantasy trilogy that would have been the riskiest gamble ever developed. Some have tried, most didn't succeed, and others were just laughed into obscurity. Where there's a whip, there's a way. Where there's a whip, there's a way. Yet the industry of cinema was changed forever when Peter Jackson's long overdue production of the first three books finally came to fruition between 2001 to 2003, and has since then been the exemplar, textbook example of capturing lightning in a bottle. Something unprecedented and with so much love and passion that many with good merits conclude that it would never happen again. It came out at the right time, with the right team, and with just the right amount of effort. It wasn't the one-to-one -one replication like other works with cuts to the story that were needed to work as a feature-length film. If there are any similarities between this and One Piece's live action, then it would be that they took out the Tom Bombadil approach to their storytelling. We love Gaimon and Tom, but they just don't work when you're drafting a plot. Plus, with One Piece, Lord of the Rings also had to juggle around these same filmmaking measures that not always to perfection. One in particular is the added character breakup in Return of the King involving Gollum and the Lamp is Bread, a forced plot contrivance to make the encounter with Shelob feel a lot more dire. No, no, not for Smeagol. Smeagol hates Mercy and Fred. You're a lying rat! You f bitch! Yeah. You piece of f You f***ing bitch! You mother f you are a piece of garbage! Yeah. That and a few others were the unfortunate victims when getting an entire book series to screen. And I feel like that rings true with One Piece especially. Sure, the Marine storyline doesn't quite hit the same as other moments. But when iconic scenes get the attention they deserve, you still feel the weight and impact. The handling of the Arlong plot could have used a lot more time in the oven, yet Nami running herself down and hopelessly screaming in anguish just as Luffy comes to insolidate and fight for Nami's freedom, I was still invested. Sanji might not have that send off like in the manga, but we still feel the connection to Zeph as he's making his final teary farewell. Even for Zoro, despite the passable performance. I still feel like he's giving his all and shouting his promise to never lose again. It's very easy to just fall into our comfort zones and not allow ourselves to be challenged by different interpretations. Anime live actions haven't made it easy to win many over, and I too was against the very notion of One Piece getting the humanized makeup. I was satisfied with what I had, and I didn't feel like they could bring something new to such an old property. Then, I started to think about what it also meant for people who, unlike me, could be seeing this for the first time. Many friends I know love anime, but others don't. Something I just have to respect. This serves its ideal purpose in slowly introducing someone who might have qualms against an anime and be introduced comfortably. 
to give in to the grand world and be transported to a pirate society about as odd and weird as the fantasy shows that preceded it. Mouton shot. All great fighters call out their finishing moves. Yeah, you're gonna fit in just fine. There is no doubt that there are aspects of live action that can't capture the drawings that Oda carefully laid out. But to see it from people who have the same amount of investment, patience, and integrity does show in the final product. You can see it with the interactions of people like Luffy and Kobe, two young kids going their separate paths and meeting once again near the end in a heartfelt goodbye. It stirs in me the same feeling watching the best of Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings. Now, am I saying what One Piece live action did is on par with Tolkien's movie adaptations? Probably not. But it's much more worthwhile, and overall, it's presenting a gold standard for any adaptation to go on. Against better judgment, and even against my own self-inserted preconceptions, this is going to be the king of live action adaptations for quite some time. In a year that has seen major Hollywood and streaming shows going more big and elaborate, the most risky of decisions are turning out to be the most profitable. You can look at things like Barbie, Spider-Verse, and this adaptation of the most successful Japanese comic book series to be diamond examples. It also highlights, unfortunately, a concerning issue that is starting to catch up to productions like it. Streaming is hitting the ceiling of what it can do for content. And unless it has the right team being given the correct amount of capital to achieve success, then we'll be seeing more stuff like Cowboy Bebop, The Flash, or Indiana Jones in the near future. One Piece live action is an imperfect improvement upon the still ongoing controversy surrounding anime adaptations. It has a tough time landing subtlety or nuance, yet it gives you exactly what you want. It's still a rubber boy gathering a crew of misfits and having fun along the way. A season 2 hasn't been announced as I record this portion of the video, but given everything I've discussed, I'll be very excited to see what they can do going forward. Not something I can say is changing the stigma we have for turning our characters into real life husks, but when it comes to One Piece, there might be hope. There might be hope. Then again, unlike Luffy, don't hold your breath. Thanks for watching, and please let me know your thoughts on this live action adaptation of One Piece. Comment down below, subscribe, and if you want to support my work, you can head over to my Patreon to see the uncensored version of this video. It's your bra man, heading out to the Grand Line.